Welcome to Litigating Against Climate Change. My name is Betsy Popkin. I'm the co-executive director of the Human Rights Center here at UC Berkeley Law. Um, and I'm fortunate to be joined here today with Julie Olden of our Children's Trust and with Louise Bedworth of the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment, or CLE, which is what I'll call it the rest of this time. Um, before I get start, we get started, I wanted to uh, thank CLE for co-sponsoring this event with the Human Rights Center. And I want to thank our teams who made this event here happen today, um, especially Judith Katz of CLE and Alexi Berlin, Maggie Anderson, Alan Ijima, and Sophia Kuner of the Human Rights Center. Um, first, I'll start with Louise. Louise has devoted her life to the environmental well-being of our communities. She is currently the executive director of CLE and the senior advisor to the California China Climate Institute. Before that, Louise spent years working for the state of California and Governor Jerry Brown, including to support sustainable communities and climate change adaptation. Thanks for being here, Louise. And now our special guest, Julia Olson. Julia is the executive director and chief legal counsel for our Children's Trust, which she founded to lead a strategic legal campaign against governments on behalf of the world's youth. She is the lead lawyer for Juliana versus the United States, the constitutional climate change case brought by 21 youth against the US government for violating their Fifth Amendment rights to life, liberty, and property all constitutional and human rights. We will be hosting a screening of the film that features this case this evening at 5.30 in 110, just next door. Um, as someone who just recently watched the film, I encourage you all to attend. Um, for a film that covers such a dark topic, the exposure of our youth to floods, fires, drought, heat waves, and food insecurity, the children who brought this case inspire so much hope. Um, but now, uh, I'm so excited to hear from Julia, what she and her colleagues have next on the agenda. <clears throat> so Julia. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming out today. I'm gonna, you're all over on this side of the room, so I'm gonna try to face more of this direction as we go. Uh, I want to thank Louise and the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment, got that right, um, for being in conversation with me today. And then, of course, for Betsy and Alexi and Alexa and everyone at the Human Rights Center for hosting this and the event tonight and making it all possible. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all. And thanks to all the students for coming out and having this conversation with us. So I thought I would start just with a little bit of background about my personal journey since you're law students you're looking at what your path is going forward and my journey so I started across the bay at UC Law San Francisco formerly known as Hastings and after that I worked at Earth Justice for a couple of years and actually someone in the audience Claudia is right over there and and then there were no gigs so I hung a shingle when I left Earth Justice and started my own solo public interest environmental law practice and I did that for 15 years or so. And I brought cases under most of the federal environmental statutes, um, litigated, I won a lot, I lost a few. And what I learned along the way is that our system of environmental law was really not wholly adequate to address the climate crisis. And a lot of the litigation we were doing was trying to stop one project at a time. And my one of my last environmental law cases was a case challenging the, the construction of a couple of natural gas power plants south of the border of California and Mexico, and all the gas was going to be piped to these, these new power plants in Mexico, and 100% of the electricity would come back into the U.S. And the reason they were built south of the border was to avoid our environmental laws. And we won the first round of litigation. We brought NEPA challenges and Clean Air Act challenges, and ultimately that project went forward with more controls, more rubbers on the plants and applied with US law, but it was just an expansion of a fossil fuel industry that needs to not expand, but retract. 
And so after I had kids and I saw these little ones who were going to inherit this mess, I decided we needed to get more creative, more strategic, and lawyers needed to work together in a more campaign-based way, not just across the US, but across the globe. And so um, I, I, I want to show you this. This is Aji, who lives in Seattle. He's a plaintiff in the Julian. This was during one round of the fires, you know, several years ago that hit the West. And um, to me, what I really realized in 2010 when we founded our Children's Trust is this is a human rights issue. This is not just about polar bears or, you know, the charismatic megafauna that we talk about in environmental law sometimes, but really about human survival. And so that was the inspiration. Um, along with all these people, these are all plaintiffs in various cases. And, and they really inspire me every day that we do work. So our Children's Trust has three main principles that we litigate by and advocate by. And the first is we're the only law firm that I know of on the planet that is only representing young people, children um, in this climate crisis struggle. And we work to not just elevate their voices in the courtroom, but also in media and in other places where they can be heard and have a say. And, and we do so also on behalf of future generations and to their climate rights. The second piece is really important as well, which is everything we do is science-based. So we're not um, ignoring what climate scientists say, we're really trying to bring that into court and have that informed decision and get enforceable orders against the systemic conduct that government is undertaking to cause the, the crisis. And then lastly, we're using fundamental human rights as the basis of our claims, which means we look to constitutions or other places where human rights law is codified or exists in common law. And I'll spend most of the time talking about the Juliana case. It's the subject of the film and it will give you a little bit more of the backbones of the legal issues in the case um, before hopefully you come watch the film tonight, which I really encourage. The filmmakers did a, a stunning job um, with this film. And then I'll also talk about some of our other state cases because we do work at the state, national, and global level. All right, so the, these are my kids. <laughs> they're, they're not all kids anymore because this case has been going on for seven and a half years. Um, when we started, they were between the ages of eight and 19. And this is um, most of them last summer in Oregon at a camping trip, brought them all together for. And amazingly, you know, seven and a half years in, they are all still 100% is really remarkable. All right, so when you think about this case and when you see the film tonight, one thing I would ask you to do is really remember that this is a children's rights case. Because what our law and our legal system does is it centers adults' rights. And it largely centers white male adult rights, right? And, and so there's all sorts of litigation that's trying to combat that in our system. But children are kind of the worst off in a lot of different ways. So remember that. And, that message came to me most strongly from a professor at DU. Her name is Catherine Smith, and I think she's one of the leading children's rights experts out there today. Um, and she said, you know, Brown versus Board of Education. Yeah, that was a case about desegregation, but that was a children's rights. Case, right. Um, and we've lost that thread a bit in, in the jurisprudence. So we're trying to reclaim that. And then this case, it's under the Fifth Amendment of the US Constitution. We're claiming that these young people's rights to life, liberty, their personal security, their right to a climate system that will sustain their lives um, and, you know, in a natural way, their rights to equal protection under the law, and then their right to access public trust resources, which are those things that are shared in common among all people like air and water and the shorelines and the oceans, that all those things are being infringed by the federal government. This is not a failure to act case. Okay, so a lot of litigation is framed in terms of what government is not doing to protect all of us. This is about what government is doing to cause the climate crisis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. All right, so 
One of the most important rulings we've received in this case was our district court judge Ann Aiken's decision in 2016. You can read it there. She said, there's a right to a climate system and it's fundamental to ordered society and it's protected by the Fifth Amendment. That opinion has gone on to really become the basis of a lot of litigation all across the world and she has cited all across the world. And that decision, that piece of her decision has not been overturned by any court, okay? So I'm not gonna walk through all this, so don't get scared. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to give you a picture of how complex this case has been in the last seven and a half years. So the, the green is when we're in the district court in Oregon. The gray is when we're up in the Ninth Circuit and the orange is when we're up at the US Supreme Court. So we bounced all over the place. And then ultimately, we land in the Ninth Circuit on interlocutory appeal. And the main question that the court addressed was the plaintiff's standing to bring the case. So just walk you through a few really key pieces of the opinion. We lost two to one. Um, so first, we'll start with the majority. And so when you read this opinion, you're like, oh, they're with you. You know, like they get this case. Um, they said remarkable things like what the government was doing was hastening an environmental apocalypse. So they looked at, at the evidence we'd put forward. We had <clears throat> dozens of experts. We had 30,000 pages of um, record evidence from the government, uh, a lot of testimony. And the court found things like this, that the extreme heat that's being caused by climate change could cause 15 to 30 feet of sea level rise. Uh, they also focused on, um, in looking at the injuries that the plaintiffs were sustaining, they looked at their medical conditions, the damage to property, psychological harm is a really important part of our cases. And then they looked at what the government was doing, and they found through the evidence that our country was expanding oil and gas development faster than any other nation, and the dissenting opinion agreed, like majority and dissent, they're in alignment, that this is an existential threat and it's actively backed by the government. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna go a little bit faster through these um, so we have time for questions. But <clears throat> basically, you know, as fossil fuel emissions increase, we see CO2 levels rising and that's just undisputed at this point. And the only solution is we have to stop burning fossil. Like it's well beyond time, there are abundant solutions and technologies available. The cheapest form of energy today is wind and solar. Um, and so our, we have experts in the case that talk about how we do this transit well. <clears throat> That's um, Alex and a uh, plaintiff and his girlfriend on their farm outside of Roseburg, Oregon during one of the fires. All right, so here's the crux of the disagreement. So we have injury, we have causation, and the next question is redressability. And that's where the majority and the dissent disagreed. The majority said that our impressive case for redress must be presented to the political branches of government. So the branches were suing because they're violating the constitution. Go to the polls and vote for your rights, right? And they said this to, at the time, about half the plaintiffs were not of voting age and have no say at the polls. <clears throat> But the dissent really nailed this issue. Uh, Judge Josephine Staten, she was sitting by designation on the Ninth Circuit panel from the Central District of California. And she said that these fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. Um, they're beyond the reach of majorities and officials. <clears throat> so the redressability issue, it's really interesting because we asked for really traditional relief. We asked for a declaration of rights. We asked for a declaration that the government's conduct was violating those rights. We asked for a declaration of a constitutional standard to protect the rights, all common stuff that you're learning in law, right? And then we asked, what the court didn't like was we asked for a plan, that the court order the government to prepare a plan about how to transition off of fossil fuels. And that remedy actually came from other court orders in, case, in desegregation cases and prison reform cases, cases where courts have routinely ordered governments to prepare plans to come into constitutional compliance. But the court didn't like that. And so that's what they really kicked us out on. And 
I'm, uh, I'm gonna skip some of this and go here because um, this is too long, but um, so these are just a few examples of the kind of structural and systemic remedies or injunctions that can happen when there are constitutional wrongs or, or violation of treaty rights, for example, of Native Americans. So before I talk about what we're doing with this bad decision, um, moving forward, I just wanted to point out everything we won. And we won every, I mean, the, the government threw every argument at us that they could in every defense. And we won that we could bring this claim directly under the Constitution. And we can bring it systemically. We don't have to challenge one power plant at a time. We don't have to use the Administrative Procedure Act and environmental statutes to bring this case. Um, we have pro we've proven that the plaintiffs are injured and the government's causing the injury. So we really did a lot of heavy lifting to bring this case forward. And redressability is the one piece left in the puzzle. So after we were remanded back to the district court on the order to dismiss based on lack of redressability, we, we quickly moved for leave to amend. Um, which is an ordinary course of action for plaintiffs. You get kicked on jurisdictional grounds or justiciability. You can go back and amend your complaint. So we removed the request for a plan. And we also did work to connect the dots better between um, the harm that was being caused and the reasons for it and what a declaration, a declaratory judgment would do to rectify that problem and why it would be meaningful to the plaintiffs. And so we really spelled it out in detail in the complaint. And that was uh, almost two years ago we filed that motion to amend, argued it summer of 21, and we are waiting patiently <laughs> for a decision, or maybe not so patiently, but we're waiting for a decision from Judge Ann Aiken and hoping to move forward once again to trial. So that piece you won't see in the film, but um, just know there's a lot of hope, and we are optimistic that we will win that motion and be back in the game with our Juliana plaintiffs. All right, so I'm gonna just take a couple more minutes before we are in conversation, Louise, to walk through some of our other cases. And the first thing I like to say is we've been collecting dissenting opinions. Um, so when you try to establish new precedent in an entire new area of law where you're taking old law and old precedent, and you're trying to apply it to a new factual circumstance, it takes a lot of work and you lose a lot. And so increasingly we've been getting these dissenting opinions and from Supreme Courts in Washington and Alaska and Oregon and the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> and we're continuing to get some losses in cases in Virginia. They're on appeal, we're briefing that right now. Um, and in Utah, where we have a really awesome right to life claim based on um, the health impacts to these kids in Utah with air quality. But we also are starting to win um, and not just win dissenting opinions. So this is these are our plaintiffs in our held versus state of Montana case where we have trial starting a two week trial starting on June 12th in Helena, Montana. So this is a state constitutional case. The Montana Constitution explicitly protects the right to a clean and healthful environment. And then they also have the substantive due process rights that the federal constitution has. So we're challenging two laws in Montana that set the state's energy policy to require the promotion of fossil fuels. And at the same time, a law that prevents the state from considering the cumulative impacts to climate change from fossil fuel burning. So we're arguing those laws are unconstitutional and the implementation of the energy policy in the state is unconstitutional. And we've gone through all the depositions um, last year and a half, we've completed discovery. We're in the motions and limine phase where we're briefing what kind of evidence can be excluded or offered at trial. And there is nothing to stop us at this point. We've already been up to the state Supreme Court and they basically green lighted the case. So we will be in trial. It'll be the first ever constitutional climate trial in the United States and the first children's constitutional climate trial in the world. So really, really exciting. 
and stay tuned. All the me major media outlets will cover it. We're hoping it will be live streamed or audio in some way as well. So um, sign up for our website to get information about that. And then one last case is Navahine versus the state of Hawaii and the Department of Transportation. We just had oral argument on the motion to dismiss two weeks ago, went really, really well. And we have trial dates for September. The judge has set a three week trial. We're anticipating getting past the motion to dismiss. This like Montana, Hawaii also has really great constitutional rights explicitly stated in the constitution about the right to an environment and your health. Um, they also have an awesome public trust doctrine, which we use in a lot. What's different about this case is you may know that Hawaii is even, I would argue, more progressive on climate in terms of what they have codified than even a state like California. But their transportation system is their number one source of emissions. And you cannot charge an electric vehicle in Hawaii unless you do it at your house because there's zero infrastructure. They don't have infrastructure at airports or at their shipping ports. They have no plans to deal with electrifying the transportation. Kids can't even walk to school because there are no sidewalks and there are no bike lanes in most of Hawaii. And so we're suing the transportation department to get them to really start planning for how do they integrate with the electricity sector, completely electrify transportation. Um, when there are electric flights happening, like tests for electric flights between islands happening, when the technology is ready, but government is really the problem. Um, and a lot of these states are getting hundreds of millions of dollars from the Infrastructure Act that the Biden administration put pushed through with no guardrails on how they spend that money. So bringing in the constitutional lens and how they have to use their resources um, to really double down on this crisis is part of what we're trying to do. All right, so ways to get involved, come work for us. Um, and I can put these back up as we talk. Um, we have a new case that we are going to be filing this spring. And we are starting to talk with youth in California who've been affected um, by fires, smoke, floods, you know, climate related impacts. Um, so if you know anyone or want to connect and talk about that, let us know. It's not a state case. It's a, it's a new federal case, but California focused. And um, there's a petition you can sign to support the Juliana plaintiffs and tell Attorney General Garland not to do an, a seventh petition for writ of mandamus against us. It would be the seventh. Um, so tell them to back down and go to trial. Um, Come to the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference in Eugene. Help us write an amicus brief. Um, in our Virginia case, your dean, Dean Chemerinsky, is helping us with a sovereign immunity brief. Um, so if anyone wants to get involved, let me know. And then join us tonight for the film. Um, well, first, I'm just going to say thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know for myself, I've been working on this for 20 years. I think we all say we work for future generations and for our kids. Um, but you're probably doing it in one of the most direct ways. So thank you. Incredible. You're welcome. Yeah, really inspiring. Um, so I think we're going to start with a few questions, but I want a, plenty of opportunity for folks in the audience to ask questions too. So um, we can sort of go back and forth. I think the one thing that came to mind for me, especially as I was watching the film and, uh, and just the amount of tension we've gotten lately in what's happened with the Supreme Court and with federal courts. So what do you see as the path for litigation right now with, you know, is it is it is all lost or do you see signs? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, all is not lost. Um, the only way it's lost is if the legal community on the progressive side gives up, right? That's the only way I think it's lost. And I think, you know, everyone in this room, like you all are learning law at a really fascinating time. And there's so much opportunity and so much ability for creativity to push the law in the direction we want to take it. And, you know, for me, like I, I'm progressive. I don't like what the right has done to the law. And I think they've been really successful because they have for decades and decades been strategic and pushed and pushed and pushed. And I think 
we, for those of us who have progressive values and want equal rights protected, we have to do the same. So I, I think we have to bring strategic cases and keep pushing. Mm -hmm. And we need to be doing it at the state level and the federal level here in this country and working both systems. Um, and, and there's one, you know, a really good example. There's a new book and I'm not gonna remember his name, but it's something like the engagement and it's about the struggle for marriage equality. And uh, he leads the, the book with this story about Hawaii and Hawaii Supreme Court in the nineties, which was the first to say that gay marriage is, is required. It's legal under the constitution and needs to be protected. And then that set off a wave of mobilization and advocacy on both sides, which ultimately culminated Bell versus Hodges, right? But without people bringing these cases to the courts, it doesn't give courts an opportunity to declare the rights. Great. Um, I guess another question um, is how you see litigation in this pathway sort of fitting in time in terms of our overall climate strategy. We're at an urgent moment in time. And I know, you know, we're all focused in the policy space on implementation, implementation, implementation. So how does the pace of litigation, which as you noted, to, as you know, you're seven and a half years in, fit into that space? And why is it still important to do? Yeah, I mean, I think the pace of everything is too slow. <laughs> Right. I mean, the pace of getting legislation passed is slow. The pace of it trickling down to rules and regulations and implementation. It's all going too slow. And I think we just have to keep mobilizing on all levers, pushing all levers um, as quickly as we can and trying to work together. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I mean, the role I see in part with the constitutional litigation is setting, setting the bar that we can't breach when administrations change. So a lot of the slow pace has been one administration will try to ramp up and then we lose and the mm -hmm. Republicans are in power and then you know we lose the momentum and we need to stop that back and forth. Right. Um, and I also think as much as the market forces are are turning, the tide's turning, right? And I, companies see the writing on the wall and we see like there's huge demand for EVs, for example. But there's so much government regulation and law that stands in the way of full implementation. There's so much. And yeah. so I think these constitutional cases can help clear the decks um, in addition to setting the standards. So in the case, in that case, because I agree, I mean, I think that the pendulum going back and forth is really challenging. And I think one advantage California has had is that we have rel had relative consistency across administrations. We don't have a lot of variation, but um, but uh, without the, in the Juliana case, without the plan, do you think that getting a victory there would still, would help to like lessen that swing between Democrat and Republican with, you know, requiring the government to have a plan? So I haven't given up on the plan. Okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think getting, so just to be frank, like when we first drafted the complaint, we thought, oh, we can ask for ordinary remedy. We won't have a problem. <laughs> and then you realize, oh, this is really politically very scary, even for Democrats, even for judges who are appointed by Obama and Clinton, <laughs> right? And, and so part of the, the dance of litigation, especially in a new area of law, is how to bring judges along a little bit slowly and coax them to where you want to get them and get them comfortable. And so we have stepped back in our new complaints. We don't ask for the big injunctive relief we ultimately want. We're asking more for declaratory judgments. And if we can get that, then we can we can always either through the same litigation ask for further relief or there can be additional lawsuits to get to the injunctive relief so it's you know it's yeah. i haven't given up on it okay. because i i believe that there does need to be planning and i think anyone working in like the environmental space environmental law space on this um so we have a let me give you an example of our florida case so in florida which is horrible on climate policy and yet has the most opportunity for solar energy than any state. 
right? Their public services commission, which is like their, their public utilities commission, they keep approving the site plans for new gas fired power plants, right? And people are trying to stop that. We um, won a rule from their, their commissioner adopted a rule that we proposed that requires 100% renewable electricity by 2050 in Florida. But the PSC is still approving all the new gas fired power plants. And so we're working on a new const constitutional case in Florida because if one arm isn't talking to the next, and if transportation isn't coordinating with the PSC about how much energy they're gonna need to be produced by renewables to electrify transportation, none of this is gonna come together. So there needs to be coordination and planning like mm -hmm. at a high level so that people know what their marching orders are. So yeah. I think plans are essential. I love plans. Um, I'm a fan. So um, I guess I'm also, as you're, are you finding it easier now to get plaintiffs? And I'm thinking just, you know, I know from when I speak with people, especially in the last few years with wildfires in California and, you know, sports practice was canceled and schools are closed or things like that. People are suddenly, um, oh. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think people are really feeling climate as part of their day to day. Oh, sorry, their day to day life in a way that maybe it seemed more distant before. Are you seeing that in the interest that in you know in joining the cases? Yeah, so we we have a place on our website where young people can reach out and contact us to get involved in litigation, and we receive regular emails. I just got one from a young person who lives in Palo Alto asking. Mm -hmm if he could be a plaintiff in a new case. Um, and I met a young person in Hawaii whose family had lived in Redding, California and had to leave the state because they couldn't stand the fires and smoke another season, mm -hmm. right? Because of health issues. So yeah, we get contacted a lot. And then we also find young people who want to be involved just you know, through talks like this and through our partners who spread the word. So it really helps to just have networks of people connect us. But yeah, a mm -hmm. lot of young people are ready to take action and it makes them feel like they're doing something meaningful. Yeah, I have to imagine it's very empowering. Very empowering. For them. Yeah. yeah. Um, final question, and then we'll turn it over to the audience to ask some questions is, um, I'm just curious, how many states constitutions, how many state constitutions have a provision around the right to a clean environment explicitly? I mean, you mentioned Montana and Hawaii. Is that unusual or are there more there's fewer that do um than don't I, I let's see it's probably i would say maybe 10 state 10 to 12 states in okay. the u.s have some provision mm -hmm. that relates to a healthy environment yeah cool um great well, i see a question do we have how do we want to is this right oh here. i think right here Uh, stop me if it's too complicated. Show of hands, seen the movie Hot Coffee. So America has been uh, brainwashed not to sue. You, you've seen Hot Coffee? No. Nobody. We're only looking for questions, not so much comments here. Oh, oh yeah, that was a question. Um, so uh, regarding uh, getting more young people involved, um, have you heard of anybody, any legal effort that's uh, interested in following the text the the nolo textbook california small claims nolo textbook uh a bunch of small claims uh, uh plaintiffs dogpiled on a refinery mm -hmm. so every few years uh 10 miles from here blows up and poisons a bunch of people and the the oil company runs out and tries to get them to settle cheap and so if they didn't, if everybody, if all the environmentalists in the Bay Area got on BART and went over there, you know, ate an onion so they're crying, take a picture of the, of the plume and they're damaged, and then sue Chevron, we would empower, instead of your five in each state, hundreds. Have you heard of anybody doing that? I haven't heard of anyone doing that. And we... Our work is not about damages. I know there are people doing that work and I think it's all important. And our work is just the 
securing the constitutional rights and the mm -hmm. implementation. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Joanna. Um, I was very moved even just seeing this presentation. Um, so thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, I had a kind of like a procedural question, but also going back to a little bit of what you already spoke about, about strategy. Um, and forgive me, I'm a 1L, so I don't know anything about civil procedure. Um, with the Juliana case, when you made the decision to kind of go back and amend the complaint, could you talk a little bit more about how you weighed that decision and what environment or what what influences might have allowed that request for a plan to go through? Uh, and I know you've talked a little bit about that already, but I'm really curious about what you're hoping or how you weighed that decision, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. So we had... We had a couple of options when the Ninth Circuit said that the plaintiffs didn't have standing because of lack of addressability. We could have petitioned the US Supreme Court for review, or we could have moved for leave to amend. Those were the options we were looking at. And uh, given the composition of the US Supreme Court and the chances of even having cert granted, um, we decided to go back down to the district court. and. I don't know if you've studied this yet in civil procedure, but actually the standard for amending a complaint, it's pretty lenient and district court judges in the federal system have a lot of leeway to grant a motion to amend. And the question that the district court judge has to answer is, is it futile? So if she allows us to amend, is it just futile because we'll get dismissed on the same grounds? And so, a couple of things have happened around the time we amended the Supreme Court came down with a new opinion on this question of redressability in another case that really favors us and actually there have been quite a few since then where you know the Supreme Court is all about giving certain people standing so those standing decisions are helping us so there's been a little bit of a shift in the, in the law and then we just tightened up that story of why declaratory judge is really important um, so the issue of the plan, we took that out of the requ request for relief, but we still have, there's a common request you put in any complaint, and it's that you, you request any further uh, and necessary relief that the court deems appropriate, right? So there's like a standard request, you put it in every complaint you ever draft. So the judge can do whatever she wants at the end of the day. There's such broad equitable discretion that judges have um, once you get to declaratory judgment in your favor, then it kind of opens the door for a lot more. So that's why we haven't given up on the hope of having some further injunctive relief. Yeah. Claudia. Just one of my great, a couple, couple questions for you. So on this theme of declaratory relief and its utility as public education, as political pressure and through other legal mechanisms, I was wondering, as the boundary between environmental and human rights law gets ever blurrier, what you have thought about bringing similar complaints to UN Special Rapporteurs in charge with taking care of the global environment who have essentially the power to issue declarations that the US is domestically committing specific human rights violations that need to be by legislation, by policy intervention, et cetera, uh, with certainly something we're doing right now for the first time. And it feels like an exciting frontier if what you're talking about is not you know, an injunction with a lot of really specific provisions. You're more in this hortatory world. Um, and then the other very different small question is I was wondering if you found any ways subtly to make use of the fact that Judge Aiken has five children. Yeah, so on the first question, we are, we, we have an attorney, our, our deputy director for our global um, program. She is working with a lot of attorneys developing those kinds of declaratory relief asks before different bodies, um, not just UN bodies, but other regional courts and so forth around the world. 
so I, I do think it will be helpful. My, you know, we didn't start with that kind of work because I really want enforceable orders against governments. And so the ability to use something that a UN special rapporteur says and hold the US government accountable, it won't really work, but it can be persuasive in, in our efforts. So, so yes, I think it's worth doing and we are supporting some of that work. And then um, judges and children, I mean, I don't know if you remember from the picture of the dissenting judges, but we've had far more success with women judges than with men, maybe un unsurprisingly, and, and people with kids. And our Montana judge, Judge Seely, she, the defense asked her um, to grant them the ability to do an independent medical examination on our plaintiffs. So they wanted to bring in their psychologist who knows nothing about climate change and mental health and have them examine our plaintiffs. And she denied that request and said, you are not, <laughs> you know, and I think because she's, you know, understands what this is like for these young people. So it does matter who the judges are and if they have familiarity with kids in their lives. Hi, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's so inspiring to hear from you because we learn about Juliana in like our climate change class, in our environmental law class, and just hearing it firsthand is so cool. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first is, how does our Children's Trust kind of coordinate global efforts, global litigation efforts when it comes to youth plaintiffs? Because it has been um, like on the rise across the globe. My second question is, how does our Children's Trust kind of manage um, like the advocacy side of things, the litigation side of things, and also the media, media angle? Because I think that when we look at youth plaintiffs in the news, it's very compelling. Um, and I'm just wondering like internally how, how that is coordinated. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start. Thanks for your question. And I'll start with your last question first. From the beginning, we wanted to have this be campaign-based strategic impact litigation, right? And you need to tell the story to the public and the media is the best way to do that. And so we have a whole communications team and they do press releases for every major moment in the case and cultivate relationships with the media and reporters. And our attorneys do a lot of interviews. So having our attorneys trained on how to talk to the media and how to give a good interview and not say too much and stick to your talking points. That's all part of the work. But with our young people who we represent, in the beginning, I, I had comms people and other adults I, I work with say, you know, like, here are the talking points for the kids. And I was like, no, nope. <laughs> like, we're not giving talking points to these plaintiffs. You know, we talk to them about their case so they're educated about the legal claims and they understand what's important about the case, but really they are best when they are just free to speak their truth and speak from the heart. So we don't script our plaintiffs when they give interviews and they're so much better at it than adults anyway. You know, <laughs> they don't go on and on and on and lecture. Um, so yeah, the media work is really important. And, and then in terms of the youth litigation around the world, in the beginning, I, I wanted it to be coordinated and I wanted us to be part, one of the groups that was coordinating that litigation. And it, we've, we're involved in a lot of it and we consult on a lot of it, we, but there's a lot that is being led by other attorneys around the world. And I have mixed feelings about it, um, in part because this is all we do and we do it in a really trauma sensitive way. We do it in a way that respects the dignity of the plaintiffs, and they truly make decisions at every step of the litigation with the consultation of their guardians and with our advice, but we treat them as whole humans who have rights. And not all attorneys know how to do that and work with young people in that way. And so I think there's been youth climate litigation in the world that hasn't totally respected the young people who are plaintiffs in those cases. And then the other thing that has happened um, is 
a lot of the global climate litigation you see, people are arguing for a human rights standard that is based on the Paris Agreement goal of allowing heating to go to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And 1.5 degrees Celsius is catastrophic for our children. And we may hit 1.5, but we don't want to stay there, right? So it's all about really paying attention to what the scientists are saying. And that, that part really makes me heart sick that there are lawyers arguing that if we keep heating to 1.5, we're protecting human rights because we are not. And then the amount, the millions, millions, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who will be displaced at 1.5 degrees Celsius is, it's devastating. So we are working really hard globally to undo that reliance on the Paris Agreement targets and have lawyers start to, start to really bring the best science into their proceedings. And if there's one thing you take away from today, bring the best evidence to your cases. You know, don't, don't rely on politically compromised information or bad science or, you know, like really give your judges, if you become a litigator, the best possible evidence and bring the best possible experts you can um, to work on behalf of your clients because they deserve nothing less than that. So thanks for giving me an opportunity to go on that little <laughs> rant. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, to me, the the majority, the two to one decision that you lost where they said, go to the polls, go to the legislature, the fact that it's youth plaintiffs is such like a such a glaring issue with that solution. So I guess I'm wondering moving forward how you're gonna address that, like because I feel like that's a pretty common talking point for conservative judges and conservative lawyers that a lot of political issues should be brought to the legislature instead of the courts. So I guess I'm wondering how that's factoring into like the strategic arguments that you might be making with your youth plaintiffs. Yeah, I mean, our, our clients really understand that. And when they heard that, they're like, well, I can't vote. <laughs> and, and of course, young people can go and and lobby and march in the streets and do all of these things. But one thing we hear from a lot of our young clients who were doing that work before they became plaintiffs is they often got like a little pat on the back. Like, it's so nice that you're here. And they had a lot of great photo ops or they had the experience that Greta Thunberg has had when she speaks before, right? Um, so they, they speak about that. And I think it's powerful when they speak about that issue. and one thing we're really trying to do, and it's going to be a stronger argument in this new federal case, is raise that equal protection argument. And right now, the, the Supreme Court has never squarely, the US Supreme Court has never squarely addressed the question of whether children are a protected class under the US Constitution. Um, so the court has addressed whether age is a suspect class in the terms of older people. And so we're going to bring that forward, working with children's rights experts, because being a child is not just about age. It's about you're a physically different human being than you are when you're an adult. And you're vulnerable, and you're developing, and you lack political rights, and you're dependent on your caregivers and your teachers, and, and you don't have money. Right? So there's all these ways in which children should really be protected so that when a court is reviewing a law or systemic conduct of government, is it disproportionately harming and discriminating against children? And so we're, we're going to tackle that issue and hopefully help develop that law just in the entire arena as well. Thank you so much again for being here. Um, I apologize, this is a more documentary focused question, but I'm unable to make it to the screening tonight. Um, I thought that the um, process of filming 
the, the like different stages of litigation was so effective and knowing that the documentary was a big piece of the communication strategy. Um, I'm just curious what if there were any sort of decisions that you had to make in terms of what you want, what pieces of the litigation were really important for the story in putting the documentary together and, and how you made the decision to sort of end at the Ninth Circuit as opposed to um, having the documentary extend um, to, to the finishing point. Yeah, so I'll say that the filmmakers, so Christy Cooper um, with Barrel Maker Productions and then she partnered with Vulcan Films, they, they produced the film. They directed, they produced, so we are, our Children's Trust is not a co-producer or part of the film crew at all. Uh, they, we partnered in terms of we helped them have access to the plaintiffs and to the lawyers and, you know, all the proceedings and did a lot of interviews. And, and then at the end of the day, the only role we even had in what the film looked like was when it got to a final cut stage, they let us review it to make sure there were no legal inaccuracies to make sure you know nothing was sort of misrepresented in terms of the law or the facts of the case. But other than that, it was the film team. So what I can tell you is after filming for, I guess it was probably six years at that point, um, and not knowing when the case would conclude, um, they had planned to see it all the way through, but it kind of came to a natural point where they wanted to get the film out in the world and hopefully help the case and not wait until the very end. So they made that decision to wrap it up. And it just so happened to wrap when it did. And you can watch the film on Netflix if you're not able to see it tonight. Um, yeah, so it was really the film crew making decisions about all of that. And they would come to us and they would ask for what they wanted in terms of access and filming and interviews. And we said yes as much as we could. And there were times we said, no, you can't film that for confidentiality reasons or other reasons. So, yeah. Thanks, you guys. You're phenomenal. This is phenomenal, first off. The, I think the Staten descent's like the best thing I've read in law school. Um, yeah. So the judiciary has changed a lot since this case was filed, mm -hmm. um, both the federal and the Supreme Court. Um, well, Supreme Court's federal, but we had the legal director for the ACLU in earlier this week, and he spoke to some creative ways that they are using originalist and textualist arguments to advance progressive ideals. And I'm wondering to what extent you're doing that in this case, if at all. Yeah, so before we filed any of our cases, when we filed our first round of 10 cases across the US in 2011. And we were looking at originalist theory at that time because, so at the time that was when Kennedy was still the swing vote on the court, but we knew we wanted to have a couple more, hopefully in the bank, like we were, we were thinking about, okay, the chief justice, John Roberts, we can get him. <laughs> and so we were developing these arguments to appeal to a conservative audience and conservative jurists from the very beginning. So we have tons of briefing and arguments. We've spent a lot of time looking at historical evidence. One of our experts is uh, more sort of an environmental historian and writes about at the time of the founding, what the founders view was on, on our natural systems and on the atmosphere. We have quotes from James Madison saying that the atmosphere is the breath of life without which we all perish, right? So we've, we've got that covered and we continue to work to build those originalist arguments. Yeah, really good question and, and really important to do in today's day and age. I think the, the problem is the court's not um, an honest originalist court. And, and so that's, that's the tricky part. But the thing about our, the fortune that we have that other movements don't have um like like reproductive rights for example where there's there's alleged rights on both sides of that question um the only 
rights, if you could call it a right, the only losers in our case are truly the fossil fuel industry and the people who rely on the fossil fuel industry, right, for money. Like it's a monetary loss, but there aren't other rights that, that are really lost if we transition off of fossil. So, so to protect this right, it's very different. So if you read this book on the marriage equality struggle, he, he makes this argument that like to give a gay couple a marriage license, no one else is really losing. There's not like a shortage of marriage licenses. And so someone doesn't get to get married because a gay couple gets married, right? So there's, and I think we have a little bit of a similar rights-based issue where there's not a fundamental right on the other side that's really in jeopardy. It's just these moneyed interests, which are very, very powerful, obviously. Um, thank you so much for being here. As someone who's followed you for a long time, it's just amazing to hear. Um, my question regards standing. So in terms of, you know, your organization as well as organizations that have, um, you know, membership standing and are able to bring cases in that way, I know it seems like the strategy would be go for the people who have the most direct impact. So children with asthma or you were, you know, talking about plaintiffs whose homes were affected by wildfires. I guess I'm just wondering how, what does that outreach look like? And do you have any um, like organizers on staff or how, how would you suggest that, um, you know, people look for, for these clients? Thank you. We, we've done it different ways. We did for a brief period, we hired someone who we thought could be like a plaintiff outreach coordinator and it, it didn't work very well and so now we really rely on our our communications team that knows and works with a lot of our partners and our litigation paralegals um, who are actually our sort of primary or first initial contact our lawyers and our litigation with potential clients i i think for some organizations it's helpful to have those people who are in communities and can go out and really identify good plaintiffs for cases. So I know some organizations do that because we work all over the country and globally. It's hard for us to have someone in the communities where we're working. And so we really rely on partners for that. So I think you can do it both ways. We've just chosen to rely on partners and our general outreach and our communications team rather than having one point person do that work. Um, but it reminds me, so going back to originalism and standing, if anyone wants to take on a good law review article project. <laughs> uh, so Article 3 says that in order to have the federal courts you know, hear, hear your case, you have to have a case or controversy. There is nothing in the constitutional text that says you have to have injury in fact, causation, or redressability. And if you, we've had some, we've done some initial research on this um, from a law clerk, but if you look at the old case line, you try to go back to originalist theory about what a case or controversy is, it is not what Justice Scalia thought it was, <laughs> right? So if we want to apply originalism to standing, our case shouldn't have had any hurdle with redressability. So we're looking at like, can we even go there and undo this ridiculous you know, strict standing tests that we have for progressive plaintiffs to come into court. Just ideas, get creative. If there, aren't, if there aren't any other questions, I'd just love to broach the subject of money because it, it's very impressive what you're doing in terms of the scale, you know, having a communications team and, you know, lawyers in different states and it's just, Sounds massive, and and I'm wondering, for those of us who are working in public interest law, where is how are you getting the funding to do this work? It's really hard. It's really hard. Um, a lot of the foundations don't want to fund us because we're too risky, right? So we're doing something new and different. Um, we do have some 
foundations that are visionary foundations and really support us. And so that's helpful. But the majority of our support just comes from individual donors, um, people who read about our work or maybe see the movie or, you know, something. But it's it's hard work to get support for for litigation in general. A lot of people are, you know, litigation averse. And then to be in sort of a new area of law that's high risk, high yield. So, you know, we rely on people like you all and, you know, spreading the word, telling people, you know, and if you know anyone who's interested in doing something different with philanthropy, you know, talk to us, get in touch. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that question. And, and I will say that our budget, one third of our budget is donated time by attorneys, law clerks and experts. So 100% of our experts who testify in these cases and prepare expert reports and declarations, they donate all of their time. And we have world-class experts, Nobel laureates. And I called, I cold call. So this is what you do. You write an email and you cold call and you tell them your story of what you're doing and you inspire them. And then you ask them to do the work for free. <laughs> and, and that's... So we get a lot of pro bono help and we couldn't do it without that. Hi again. <laughs> um, I had a question about in response to your thoughts on like different ways to strategize and also Grace's question also inspired me when thinking about standing. Um, so Brazil has the right to culture and they've, there have been activists there who have been able to tie indigenous rights to the Amazon and to their land as part of that right to culture. And there are special repertoires who also comment on this as well. Have you been able to see that as a potential way of intersecting the work at our children's trust with maybe organizers or philanthropists who are also seeing this right to nature and a right to a part of a, um, how do you say, like a, um, like a right to culture or, or I don't know how to say, it, but cultural enrichment, I guess. Um, or is that a potential, uh, could that even be a part of a potential legal strategy? So, so it is, we have, under the substantive due process clause um, and the liberty clause um, that's in state constitutions or our federal constitution, we do bring a right to culture and sometimes it's family autonomy is one way it's expressed, but to culture on behalf of a number of our plaintiffs. And we, gosh, you know, maybe a f at least a quarter of our plaintiffs are indigenous or native. And um, I think like half or more than half of our Hawaii plaintiffs are Native Hawaiian, for example. So we are very much bringing in that right to culture, um, customary practices, traditions, and the loss of those into these cases. So a couple of the plaintiffs in the Hawaii case, they're losing their cultural land. It's being washed away by sea level rise. They're losing burial grounds. They're losing the ability to farm their taro fields. They're you know, losing a lot. Um, Jamie, my plaintiff from Arizona, who's DNA, she's from the Navajo Nation. She, they've lost their springs and their ability to harvest the ceremonial plants that they use as part of their tradition. So um, we bring in those arguments. And I think you know, our next phase, we, we've, we've also developed some religious freedom arguments and First Amendment arguments that we're looking at making you know, in the future. So if anyone's interested in coming and helping us work up those, that's also next in line. And we actually, we, ha we have a draft um, case in Brazil that we've been working with some partners on, but it's, it's not going anywhere for the time being. But um, Brazil actually has huge plans to develop their offshore oil mm -hmm. drilling. Um, huge problem. So we're kind of looking at ways we might affect that in Brazil if you're interested. Anything else? 
Well, I think I'll just say thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. And these were amazing questions. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, maybe just you can at the end just share what we should be looking for in terms of what, what are the victories you're hoping to have over the next year or two? So we should hear from the Hawaii court in a couple months. And if we get the thumbs up, then we're preparing for trial in Hawaii in September and the Montana trial. And any day I know Judge Ann Aiken is going to rule on our motion to amend. Um, the moment that hits, we are, we are busy and jamming and we will need help. <laughs> so um, the, the, those are the big ones right now. Yeah. And then this new case, new federal case, um, California youth, if you want to get involved, uh, reach out, give us a shout. And thank you so much. Really great questions. It's so fun to be back with students and in classrooms again after not doing a lot of public speaking the last few years. So thanks for having me.